Welcome back, everybody. Um, up next, we have Suzanne Baxter. Uh, Suzanne is a mathematical physicist and junior lecturer for the Learn Programming Academy. Uh, she took up Python programming during her degree independently of her studies because it seemed like a good idea at the time, and she asserts that it is still a good idea. Uh, we'll be playing a pre-recorded talk by her, and she'll be in the chat answering questions as we go. So without any further ado, uh, take it away, Suzanne. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk on procedural generation. My name is Suzanne Baxter, and I'm a freelance Python programmer with a degree in mathematical physics. Today I'm going to show you how to create the terrain of an island using procedural generation in Python. Procedural generation is the process of creating something programmatically, sometimes but not always with random or pseudo-random elements. It is most commonly used to create levels, textures, and assets for video games, it works best when you want a lot of similar, but not identical, examples of the same thing, like plant models or levels with the same theme. Another benefit of procedural generation is saving memory by not needing to store as much content because it's being generated on demand, but technology has advanced to the point where this is no longer the main incentive. In most disciplines, random noise is something to be minimized or avoided, but procedural generation uses it as a common raw material, especially for creating terrain. However, not all noise is equally useful. To demonstrate, here's a picture of random noise. It has a tendency to cluster, but doesn't have any recognizable structure. It doesn't look like anything in particular. What we need is something that looks random globally and acts predictably locally. This looks a bit better. This is Perlin noise, developed by Ken Perlin in 1983 because of his dissatisfaction with computer-generated imagery of the time. We're not going to use it because it has visible directional artifacts, but I'm mentioning it anyway because it's historically important, very commonly used, and libraries for producing it come built in to several game engines. What we are going to use is open simplex noise, because it's more efficient, looks better, and a Python library for it already exists, so we don't have to implement one ourselves, which is particularly good, because the mechanism for producing it is quite complicated mathematically. One layer of noise on its own doesn't look very impressive, and the solution to this is to add more. One effective way to do this is to create a fractal structure by resizing the noise and adding it back to itself. Each successive layer of noise has structures half the size and magnitude half as strong. For this terrain, I used a two-dimensional NumPy array and seven layers of noise. I also applied a circular gradient to force down the edges so that it would be an island rather than a section of inland terrain, normalized the height and padded the edges a bit. At the end of this stage and after each of the next stages, the grid is saved as a file. The end result is a height map that looks like this. You can easily see where I padded the edges, but that will disappear after the erosion, and the edge would be underwater anyway. It's not immediately obvious on the island, but even with a large number of layers, purely noise-based terrain tends to look blobby and uniform on large scales. It looks like a real landscape when you take small parts of it in isolation, but not when you consider it as a whole. There are ways of mitigating this using even more noise manipulation, but that's not what we're going to do. The next thing we're going to do to this island is add some mountains along one edge. One of the drawbacks of noise is that it doesn't naturally produce long and thin structures like mountain ranges and rivers, so I used a different technique. I made a mask covering the part of the island that was above a certain height then offset this mask in a random direction. I overlaid the offset version with the original and took a sliver of area that was covered by one but not the other. I then used scikit image to reduce that sliver to a line, warped and blurred it, and multiplied it by another layer of noise to roughen it. I then added it back to the original terrain. Up until this point, I've stored the terrain as a height map. 
which is a 2D grid of values where each value represents the height at that coordinate. This is a fairly common format and for many genres it's entirely adequate, but it does have limitations. It doesn't lend itself well to destructible terrain, which might be a problem depending on what genre of game you're making, and it doesn't allow for caves and overhangs either. For that reason, I converted my height map to voxels in a three-dimensional grid before I applied the erosion. Each entry in the grid represents a cube in 3D space, and each point containing solid ground starts with a density value of 1. Each empty cube has a density value of 0. The general idea behind the hydraulic erosion simulation is that you have water droplets falling as rain onto your landscape. When a droplet hits the ground and as it rolls along, it picks up earth and dissolves minerals, which I model as subtracting from the density of voxels it passes over or through. As it evaporates, its capacity to hold material diminishes and it starts depositing instead, adding to the voxels. Over time, mountains are worn down and basins are filled in. This part of the process was by far the most computationally expensive, taking about 15 minutes per island to do 25,000 droplets, while the other processes took only seconds. However, this was on one CPU core without any parallelization, optimization, or usage of the GPU, so with a bit of work you can get it to go much faster. The code is quite long, so it's spaced out over several slides. First we have our imports, some setup code, and a helper function. Now we have a class for the droplet itself with its properties. It has a velocity, a maximum amount of material it can carry, and a location determined randomly on creation, as well as a valid attribute to determine when to remove that droplet and move on to the next one. All the other properties are either for deriving those properties or assessing the droplet's immediate surroundings. The isInside method determines whether the droplet has rolled off the map, and erosion deposit does exactly what it sounds like it should do, eroding from a non-empty voxel in the immediate vicinity if there is one and the droplet has the capacity to carry more earth, and depositing if it is on the ground and has picked up more than it can carry. The move method accelerates the droplet down if it is airborne, then shifts the droplet into an adjacent empty cell in a direction as close to its existing velocity as possible. If a change of direction is required, the droplet's velocity is nudged in that direction plus a random perturbation. The Check stuck method determines whether the droplet has rolled to a stop. Finally, we have the main loop, which alternates between moving and eroding as long as it is doing so is productive for that droplet. The simulation does this for 25,000 drops. The end result looked like this, with the original on the left for comparison. As you can see, a few things have happened. The first is that the eroded terrain has developed several creases and ridges around the central peak. This was exactly what I wanted. The other thing that has happened is that the indentations in land have been filled in. For an erosion simulation, 25,000 droplets is not very many, so I could have run it for longer for a more pronounced effect. Here's the final product in all its three-dimensional glory. I got the 3D mesh from the grid of voxels using Scikit Images implementation of the Marching Cubes algorithm. It's worth noting that no part of the process used true randomness. It was all pseudo-random. What this means is that while it superficially appears random at first, it's actually deterministic. If I run the code 10 times, I get the same result every time. The pseudo-random generators were all seeded with the same number to generate their values, and the island I've been using as an example was created by using a seed of zero. By changing the seed, I can choose from among millions of possible outcomes. These islands, seeds zero through to five, are just the tip of the iceberg. The erosion simulation, while illustrative, 
is too slow to use to dynamically generate levels for a game. Players are permissive of loading times when creating a large world, but I would like to use larger maps, and 15 minutes is already too long. For that reason, the next step is to rewrite the erosion code to take full advantage of modern GPUs. However, that is a new and separate endeavour to be undertaken another time. So thank you for watching, and enjoy the rest of the conference.